Nick Glensman, co-founder of Malgram Glensman Partners. It is so great to welcome you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me, Nick. Pleasure to be on the show, Julia. Looking forward to it. I am too. And Nick, I was hoping we could start with a quick backgrounder um, into you and also uh, get an update on the work that you are doing today with Harold Malmgren at Malmgren Glensman Partners. Let's start there. Sure. Okay. So my background is um, uh, I'm from the finance sector. I spent quite a long time at Salomon Brothers. Uh, it didn't dent my character too much. I love the place though. It was, it was, it was a, a phenomenal place uh, where you learned a lot. And um, which is why so many of my colleagues and myself included went into the hedge fund business in the end. And I ended up uh, on a couple of different occasions working for Brevin Howard, which I absolutely loved. You know, um, so that's my background. Um, from an investment bank, Salomon Brothers, where I ran futures and options, actually, and uh, then into Brevin Howard as a portfolio manager. Um, and then Harold, well, Harold, prior to his period in government, was a chair, economic chair of Cornell University, then got tapped on the shoulder and went and worked as, I guess, special ambassador is the, the term usually used, but special ambassador, special advisor uh, for JFK, LBJ, Gerald, uh, Richard Nixon, and Gerald Ford, um, which tells you he sort of they can you can't box him into a certain side. And um, his one, you know, apart from his incredibly broad foreign policy experience, he also had deep experience in trade policy, which there's obviously the overlap. And uh, he was. You know, he's the only non-lawyer uh, to ever be quoted in a, a Supreme Court's trade decision. So um, he has that to go and upsets a few lawyers, apparently. So, but, um, so the work we're doing is what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to fuse uh, macroeconomics, financial markets, and geopolitical developments because... The, that last category has certainly come to the fore as we've seen a, a, a perceived split decoupling between China and the rules-based order, uh, for want of a better, better definition. I'll call it the West, but it also includes Japan and Australia and New Zealand, obviously, uh, and other Asian countries. And um, what we try and do is we look at the situations and we have very deep research behind every special paper we do. Um, speaking to a lot of people, be they in government, be they in military, etc., and then build up a, a narrative that can en enable us to then say, okay, this will be the implications going forward in the financial market. So there's always actionable ideas coming towards the end of each paper. And I think, you know, people come to us, okay, what's going to happen six months from now and going forward? And that's the sort of work we do. And then we also, that, so that's our, our, our main institutional side, so, you know, big special papers and consulting. And then we also have um, a daily macro newsletter that fuses all of this. So what we're looking to be able to offer people is, you know, uh, a full narrative um, and actionable ideas, one of which, which is, I think is still going quite well today. Um, yeah. We went back in the end of January, beginning of February, we went long the dollar against the Chinese yuan at 677. And today we're at seven, just above 714. And I don't think that's changing. So I think that carries on. Um, so that's what we try and do. And we're trying to you know, help uh, clients manage their risk. Be they, you know, in terms of the institutional side, it's all about risk management, where you can be, where you should go, what you should be considering as a fiduciary. And then with regard to the daily, we've, we, we, you know, it's part of the institutional package, but we've been able to spin it out as well to make it available to registered investment advisors, family office, small family offices that can't afford the bigger, the bigger um, invoice, shall we say, or charges. And also to, 
you know, retail investors, because if you if you're trading the markets, you really need to know, um, and you should be as informed as possible. So that's our objective. I love that. And I imagine, you know, the two of you incredibly plugged in on all things macro markets, geopolitics. And so, Nick, uh, I want to get your assessment of the current macro environment as well as um, your assessment of the current um, market environment as well. Let's start there, kind of big picture. Big picture. Well, obviously, everybody's wondering whether the Fed's going to raise again. Um, <clears throat> I think, I mean, I'm, Pretty sure the ECB are going to be raising again. I suspect the Bank of England are going to be raising again. Australia raised overnight, uh, which up until a couple of days ago, nobody was expecting. Um, meanwhile, China eased a little bit, but you know, this is all very, you know, given people are praying for huge stimulus out of China, nothing but disappointment. You know, this is, it's more. What the Chinese tend to do in this situation is a lot of noise, and actually the impact is very small. Um, now, vis-a-vis -vis the Fed, because you know, if you go on the basis that if the US sneezes, the rest of the world catches the cold, um, I sort of think it's. I think the Fed are gearing up for a pause this month. I was at fifty-fifty, but I'm a little bit more on the pause side. Uh, we have to wait to what CPI does uh, when that data comes out. But um, I think they will raise again. I think they will, but they will keep things higher for longer. They will keep rates higher for longer. Uh, and I suspect if we don't start to see the consumer slow down and, and employment ease up a bit, they may be tempted to go a few more times. I mean, it strikes me. I thought yesterday's presentation by Apple of the new ski goggles that do everything for everybody. People are going to spend $3,900 on that. I think the Fed should be raising rates by another 1%, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, that I can't think of anything more pointless than what I saw there. I mean, obviously... You know, go and try them out. I'll go and try them out at some point in the future. But I didn't see in that presentation anything that got me excited whatsoever. You know, so um, I do expect, you see, the central banks have a history of making mistakes. And they also don't typically, particularly in the case of the Fed, they don't typically stop until they break something. Now, people were thinking the uh, regional bank crisis, starting with SVB, was an example of something being broken. I tend to think that was exaggerated. I think that was more a case of several banks. Usually it seems to be centered around California, but there was First Republic as well. Just asset liability mismatch, bad risk management, and also paying the price for everything being at a touch of a button. You know, you can, you, you can access your account and, and wipe it out, you know, send the money out of the account into another bank account, like that. So that's the change. Uh, you know, uh, I tend to view what I think, that, but it's now it's gone forward into the commercial real estate. Now, what's interesting about that is if you go back to the early 1970s, uh, the UK had a very similar uh, situation. It was a secondary banking crisis. It was the smaller finance houses that were in trouble. And that forced the Bank of England to initiate uh, a package called the lifeboat, where they got all the big banks putting money in along with them. Obviously, as things progressed, it was more the Bank of England than any of the other banks. But that, once they saved the smaller secondary banks, it then became a commercial real estate issue. And it was predominantly those in developed offices, predominantly in the, in the UK, but also abroad, English companies, um, who needed savings. They became part of the lifeboat. And if you look at this, you know, people are broad brush commercial real estate issue in, in the US. It's not, it's predominantly offices. And this is structural, not cyclical. Since the pandemic, work practices change. So there's a structural change 
in the, the need for office space. And then, yes, you've got residual with the, the residential side. It's not all bad, though. If you look at commercial estate office space, uh, factory space, well, if we're de-risking, decoupling, and onshoring and friendshoring, it'll be premium for factory space. Now, I don't know how you could, I don't, I don't, I'm probably there are one or two REITs that do that, but you know, that's where I think you go. And, and the trouble with commercial real estate is the banks are, are done. I mean, the, you know, the big banks, the systemic banks, 1% of their assets, commercial real estate, insignificant. The uh, small regional banks, you've, they average about 20% exposure manageable the but you will have concentration risk with a couple of them that probably needs sorting out cmbs that's problematic i saw that there was what a hotel group in uh, san francisco mm -hmm. in november there's a, a cmbs that matures and they've stopped paying back on it because it's against two of their hotels and those are the hotels targeted for getting rid of uh, been defined as we're going to get rid of these for idiosyncratic San Francisco issues, which you could, we could all imagine what that is right now. Um, so I, I think it's quite lim it's limited to office space, but that when when you say limited, so the people that will pay that is the secondary bank banking system or the secondary finance sector, pension funds and insurance companies. Uh, pension funds would have had more exposure to CMBS, insurance companies, direct exposure, you know, debt or equity. And, and that's where the pain will be predominantly taken. You know, I think Calcis came out with a 50 billion loss in their commercial real estate. So, it's, you know, it's, it's gone beyond the regional banks, more, which are quite controlled now. And it's in these big pension funds and insurance companies where the pain will be taken. Uh, they have deep pockets, but one wonders how deep at some, some points. Um, so I tend to think over the next, I'll give you a wide bit off a spread, six to 18 months, we will enter into a big, into a fairly sharp, nasty recession. And I don't think the election will matter to the Fed. Uh, the, November, the November past election didn't matter to the Fed. It shouldn't matter to the Fed. They need to be apolitical. Yes, the board has changed. There are more Democrat-appointed members of the Fed, but people need to remember the Federal Reserve is not a democracy. Powell is a chair. Um, Waller's effectively, even though it's, it, it's not Waller as vice chair, but Waller is effectively right behind Powell in terms of policy. And to be honest with you, we haven't seen the likes of Kashkari change. He's been very hawkish. So there's enough hawks there that, that that will carry through. And, you know, I think the recession will probably be driven by higher for longer rather than rates. People seem to also forget that the thing that I'm worried about now for risk right now is there's going to be this huge vacuum cleaner sound of liquidity being sucked out of the system. You've got this treasury bill issuance and the cash management bill around a trillion. And people say, well, that's, you know, market. Don't think of it just that, like that. ECB will finish the TLTROs. They have to be paid back. Sounds like some Italian banks may not be able to do that, but that's a great sucking sound out of the, mm. the the global liquidity. I ignore China because it's usually China centric. Um, then Bank of England is doing QT, Fed's doing QT, ECB is doing QT as well. Then you look at the Japanese, they seem at the present moment in time to have calmed down the challenges to yield curve control. So they're not intervening. So there's less liquidity there. So I tend to think that you've got a trillion from the treasury catch up after the debt ceiling deal was done. But you also have a trillion plus QT, TLTROs, a variety of stuff. That's an enormous amount of liquidity that was in the marketplace, um, which will be pulled out of the marketplace. 
And that's problematic because, you know, you just look at where we are right now. It's very narrow, mm. has been very narrow on the equity market, and it's quite liquidity driven. So if you ask me what do we watch to see the impacts of this, every Thursday the Fed issues uh, H4, the Friday H8. We watch bank reserves. Somebody like AC Hunt watches uh, ODL. And if you look at the bank reserves and you draw that over a historical period for the last three years, correlation with the, the value of the, the uh, US stock market, right? Not just not the price level, the value. Perfect. It's great correlation. So if, it, if, for example, the treasury bills, treasury notes, and cash management bills being sucked out impacts the reserves more without you know more than the repo you're going to start to see uh, some drawdowns in the equity market but overall i think there's a, a harsh um eureka moment in terms of liquidity and i think that's that should be a shadow that everybody should be concerned about for risk yeah if you don't mind, I'd love to hear more on the liquidity side of things, because that sounds to me like when I'm listening to you, that's an, a critical part of the markets and it has a lot more implications. Maybe for the person who might be a bit more new to this, I, my my audience is diverse in their skill sets and um, I guess their, their knowledge when it comes to markets. Can we just go a little bit further on the liquidity worry for you? Well, if you look at what happened in the run-up, let's, let's take the U.S. situation. I think it, it's quite good. Uh, if you look at what happened in the run-up to the debt ceiling agreement, Janet Yellen was drawing down on the, T, the Treasury's account of the Fed. So that was mitigating the Fed's QT, quantitative timing, and in certain instances was greater than the quantitative timing. So it was effectively... The liquidity impact was as if there was more QE. We know what QE did to risk prices and equity prices. So if you reverse that, there will be excess de facto QT because she'll be building up the treasury account, TGAO, all over again um, at the Fed. And that's part of the sucking out of the system. Then it's a question of who's buying uh these bills is it going to be the banks probably not likely but is it going to be money market funds and are those money market funds going to be getting more cash out of people who transfer from their deposit accounts um you know what's the two years? let me just have a look at the two two years yield is 451 bills are north of five percent it's not bad is it the, the range the range of yields i think those go up because of the system certainly on the bill side um so that's quite a nice risk return guaranteed your money back <clears throat> so the question is do people where do people if it's individuals or funds and say where do they take the money if they want to get some of that return well it's either out of their bank deposits or out of their stock market accounts and so that's where it is you know that's where the impact on um, risk assets manifests itself, either conversion from stock market into these high yielding assets at the short end of the US treasury market. And when you think about it, quite a lot of the stock market hasn't been that great. If you're in small caps, you're, you're down here, right? So why would you be down here when you can do five, north of 5% on the treasury? It makes no sense. Um, especially if we're going into a situation. I tend to think that this issuance will probably keep pressure on the yield curve inverted. And that's never the point where the markets, the stock market is in danger. The danger is what I call a, um, a de-inversion and move to a steeper yield curve. So that yield curve starts to steepen, or de-invert, that tells you that the bond market is anticipating recession down the road. Mm. Okay? Yeah. So 
you've got forewarning of recession with the yield curve as it is now. And as it de-inverts and, and is positive, if we want, the minute we start to see that the yield curve positive, say twos, tens, that is a huge sign that there's a, a, a recession coming because they're compressing short rates in anticipation of the Fed having to cut rates. But at the moment, the Fed is telling you longer for longer for higher for longer. Um, they're going to continue with their quantitative tightening, which all along they've said automatically carries on in the background. Okay, that's in the background. So pulling out liquidity from one area, be it bank deposits or stock market, into funding. And that could be fund managers, that can be individuals, whatever, into funding this trillion dollar issuance. That's where liquidity gets drawn out of risky assets. Now that's going on around the world, <clears throat> I would say with the exception of China, but I've never really viewed China's liquidity as being relevant for the rest of the world. It's kept internally, there's a you know, closed capital account, it's not intended for to flow through to the rest of the world anyway. It's where it's intended to help is boosting growth of China and that increased growth, which increases their demand for commodities and various parts and, uh, you know, along the supply chain. That's where the growth boost is. It's not a liquidity thing. Thus, it's not relevant for the equity side, except on positive economic growth. So exclude the China liquidity. All the other major areas are pulling liquidity out. Having boosted liquidity during the pandemic in very aggressively, pulling it out. And um, I suspect also you'll see, we've already seen it in the UK, some fiscal austerity begin to kick in. You're going to get that in the U European Union next year. And I think the point of the debt ceiling agreement was fiscal austerity. Let's start that process. You just can't carry on spending at this pace. Um, so that's also a negative for risk. Yeah, yeah, it is. I want to hear more on China. I think this is such an important conversation, and it's one that's not happening enough in more traditional uh, financial media, call it. Um, because you're talking at the top of this conversation around a decoupling um, and some of the bigger implications. I know you and Harold have done a lot of work on the subject. So I'm going to pass it to you and just let you kind of frame up how you're thinking about China. Okay. So the point about China is we, and this is something that the mainstream media for some reason doesn't cover. So the West, again, I will include Japan and Australasia in the West and some of the Asian countries. Their objective is to, you can include South Korea, by the way, they're getting closer to Japan, which nobody thought would, would happen. There is a decoupling from China, which is practiced belligerent foreign policy in terms of, well, in terms of foreign policy, diplomacy, and also trade policy. Okay. And during, you know, during the pandemic, people saw the exposure, what, you know, the rules-based order countries, the West, had to China. They saw the impact of that, that supply source gets cut. That's what, that's what caused a lot of the, inf the inflation, but it caused severe strain. So given the political climate and the economic climate, it made sense for a move towards reshoring, onshoring, friendshoring, which is going on right now. Okay? Now, the, the conventional press coverage is all about the US decoupling, and the new term they're all using is de-risking. It's decoupling. What they're missing is China's decoupling too. China are decoupling from it. They're, they're trying to move towards the, the emerging market um, client base as, a bit, as opposed to sticking with the developed markets. So there's a decoupling there. But also China's decoupling from its previous economic model. She has Stalinized the China, domestic China political framework 
and he has rejected Deng Xiaoping's economic model, which was followed by everybody, including Xi, during his first term. Okay, if you then go, but there were hints during that first term, and uh, Senator Mark Warner, who was on the House Intelligence Committee, has been quoted as saying, you know, from 2013 on, when Xi took over, there was a lot of noise there that was very concerning about intellectual pro property theft, so on and so forth. So what you've got now is we've got CFIUS, where people, people, uh, the Chinese, I don't think they name the Chinese as such, certain foreign act actors. Which is intended for China, but you would you could also include North Korea, Iran. So, you know, China can't buy anything it wants, particularly sensitive technology, sensitive land, sen sensitive production. And what we came, we started to hear at the beginning of the year that there was a move towards a reverse CFIUS to control <clears throat> to control the um, outward flow of investment money. Because a lot of investment money has been invested in companies that are part of the military industrial complex in China. Okay, you know, particularly the advanced technology companies. We had a chart in there, but the thing about it is um, some key things have occurred recently. So you've had reverse CFIUS, and that is there. It hasn't been issued as an executive order by Biden yet, but it was driven towards an executive order because it's the one to, China's the one topic Congress, both houses, can agree on in a bipartisan manner. And as we move to the November 24 election, the rhetoric on China is going to get quite tough because everybody agrees. So the tougher you are, you know, it, the more upside there likely is. Um, now, on the reverse CFIUS, you're going to see out, outbound investment. This is the initial phase, probably with the executive order, which has been held back from, from what we hear for a, a short period be, as alternative rare earth and critical minerals get sourced. But the outbound investment that will be banned completely will be any investment into China in advanced semiconductors. So any co Chinese companies producing a semiconductors, that's going to be banned from US investors. And by the way, the European Union is going to do the same thing, and the UK is already going to do the same thing as well. There's a lot of synergy with this. Uh, it was discussed during G7. Jap They're all doing it. It's full agreement. Um, for outbound investment that will be subject to notification, includes quantum computing and artificial intelligence. You can see all of this is going to be required for the next, you know, the next generation of military hardware. Um, now, at the moment, that would affect, the areas of capital that would affect would be venture capital, private equity, corporate investments, so where corporates invest in China. Um, and it will only involve new investments, won't involve past investments. However, the Chinese have already reacted to it, so it becomes a rolling snowball impact. And we believe that later on, when Congress comes out with its own legislation, you will see investments barred or subject to notification, clean energy technology, biotech, biomanufacturing and critical minerals. Uh, and then what you will also see is publicly traded investments will be impacted. And there could even be retroactive clawback on previous investments. So our, our thesis is we're not specifically anti-Chinese, but there's a lot to tell you. You've got to be very careful about where you put your money. Now, it's got worse recently. Um, I think you're aware of Bain and Mints having been visited by Chinese police. Okay? Their offices, Bain's offices yes, in Shanghai. Bain. Oh, I was, yes, Bain. Yeah. First, consulting. And Forest Research has left. Cat Vision was also visited. 
This is a consequence of uh, additions to the Chinese espionage law that was brought in on April the 26th. Now, prior, there were signs something was coming because the, the security police, so the equi Chinese equivalent of the FBI and CIA, have been spun out of the CCP and the chief reports directly to Xi. So Xi now has PLA, CCP, and the SSA reporting directly to him. Um, this espionage law change basically means due diligence is banned. Due diligence will be considered espionage by the Chinese. The person that's put, been put in charge uh, of looking into all these activities of due diligence, particularly by US companies, is a chap called Chen Shijin. He was the man that was in charge of Wuhan during the lockdown. This is, he is the equivalent for Xi of Beria for Stalin. Head of security can arrest him every once. And the key, the key thing there is after this came out, and after some, you know, the situation with Bain uh, and others, U.S. State Department issued a travel advisory warning, saying U.S. citizens need to be careful about traveling to China because you could be detained or arrested and not have access to consular services. Directly linked. So that, I know several big funds no longer sending any of their people to China to look into you know to look into companies to do the normal research that you would do because they don't know. So as apart from, despite the fact that Li Chang, who's she's number two, saying we want more foreign investment, she's got a whole different security state working against that. And basically, that confirms a fact which we all saw occur when uh, China, during the when she was re-elected, he got rid of anybody with economic and foreign economic experience, like Liu He, Li Qichang, his former number two, out. In came political ideologues. So in in Xi's head, political ideology trumps economic pragmatism. Okay. But the point we're making is you've got to be secure. If you're a fiduciary, be it a fund manager, be it a corporate decision maker, C-suite decision maker, you've got to now consider the risks of being able to get what you have in there out. Mm. And that may not be the case. I'll give you an anecdotal example. Yeah. Someone who couldn't get it out recently. A friend of mine is... Long experience in telecommunication, telecommunications VC, venture capital. And he'd been invested in a fund that was a West Coast fund. They were invested in a Chinese company that IPO'd recently. Oh, no, a big one, IPO'd over a year ago. So, under the terms of the documentation, which is standard, we all understand it, you as a, a a pre-IPO investor can't sell your shares for a year. Stated in the documentation, that's standard US documentation too. Stated in the documentation. So they, the year passed and they went to start selling the shares. The Chinese regulators said, you can't do that. And they said, well, it's in the documentation. Chinese regulators, no, well, maybe in the doc documentation. I've just said, you can't do it. So what we then said was, look, the law of finance is common law, mm -hmm. UK, US common law, and it works throughout the system. Um, here in the case of China, it's law decided by one man and the goalposts keep moving. So if you go into an investment looking, you know, hoping that IPOs, and then you're able to get out, you know, having made your profit, after the year's restriction, and you're now told you can't, what are all those investors going to do? Never touch China again. Now, we're saying you've got to extrapolate this, and you've got to look upon the risk. Um, 
And you've also, by the way, in definition of China, you have to include Hong Kong. It's mainland China. That's it. Gone. Uh, since the 2019 demonstrations against the, uh, what was the law? Um, it was a new security law. Uh, Hong Kong is effectively de jure mainland China. So it's the same. So, I, you know, this is why you're seeing huge amounts of money trying to get out of Hong Kong into Singapore. This is why you're seeing Singapore has had inflow of new fiduciary accounts, be it family offices or new funds, six times greater than Hong Kong. Because Singapore is a common law entity. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong, you don't know what the law is anymore. So this is the risk. Yeah. Um, I, on the thing, oh, I was sorry. <laughs> no, no, you were about to, you said something. Oh, I didn't, I didn't I was, catch no, it. you're great. Uh, you are, you're amazing, Nick. And I love like listening to you. I was just going to ask you, you um, man. because it's a curiosity and I, I talked to a lot of very successful folks. I'll put it that way. And I, I've heard Singapore come up a couple of times, um, on the Singapore point of folks trying to get their money into Singapore. What are you hearing anecdotally? If you are hearing anecdotally, like how that process is, is that very difficult? Um, Getting money that? out of Hong Kong is really difficult. Um, if you recall, uh, there's a Chinese chap, Bao something or other, I can't remember, but he was one of the investment bankers in China that was a tech specialist, you know, involved with SoftBank and everybody else, really of a solid name was trying to get $200 million out of Hong Kong and Singapore to start a family office, got detained. I haven't heard from him since. Uh, I do know of an American who had, don't ask me why, I have no idea why, had $250 million in Hong Kong. Hasn't been able to get it out yet. Um, so it's hard to get the money out despite what people say and i you know i've i've traded chinese assets you know predominantly chinese bonds um and you used to do that through the hong kong shanghai connect okay um and you used to have all the people you knew from hong kong they were all there if i was to do that now there's nobody i know in hong kong anymore they've all left they're all in singapore um all the, all the bankers I know and trust and could turn around and say, look, I've got this position, get me out of it discreetly, I'll leave it with you. I can't do that anymore. And the other thing about this, if you look at the bond market, this is how bad things get. There used to be three sources being able to watch on the screens what the Chinese bond market is doing. Rather like you can watch on Bloomberg or Reuters, what treasury prices, UK gilt prices, German boon prices, right across the curve, okay? That data source has been stopped by the Chinese government because they think it's data that's going outside of China and can be used against them. So you have nobody that can, you, you've got no visibility of what's going on in the Chinese bond market in that respect. Bloomberg used to have pricing sourced by one of these. It's all gone now. So you don't know what price. So in effect, you have one market maker, and that's the Chinese government. So if you're if you're a foreigner trying to get money out, do you think you're going to get a fair price? No, you're not. Mm. And then also, you don't have any of the people that you used to talk to. So it's uh, I just think they're making it impossible. Um, and you know, you're seeing companies pull out. Yeah. You are seeing companies pull out. Vanguard has closed. Ontario Teachers has closed their offices. Um, a couple of other pension funds are closing their offices. Obviously, I think the due diligence consultancy firms are going to exit because that's the end of their business in terms of due diligence. Due, due diligence. Um, and as I said, a lot of the foreign fund managers are not allowing their people to go in there anymore. Just so... You know, not and going, if not going into mainland China, not going into... How about Hong Kong? Same. Can't go. It's the same thing. Do not differentiate between Hong Kong and mainland China. Can't differentiate. Their latest, the latest thing that's gone on is Jimmy Lei, who was uh, a, a media magnet. He actually has a full British passport. 
Okay, not the special Hong Kong British passport. He has a full British passport. He got arrested during the troubles, the pro-democracy demonstrations, and he's been trying to use British lawyer within the Hong Kong system, which prior to all, all the upheaval in, starting in 2019, you used to have regularly British or Commonwealth lawyers, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, on the Apple Court in Hong Kong. It'd be sent for six months, okay? Because it was, effect, it was effectively considered the same legal system. That stopped. No longer welcome. And you used to be able to use you know, uh, British Kings, well, they're now called King's Council. They used to be called Queen's Council before, prior to uh, Queen Elizabeth dying. That seems to be discouraged and stopped. So, no, Hong Kong is not independent. Hong Kong is part of China. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've got friends who, who lived there for 20, 30 years. The minute it started, they either moved to Singapore or, or Tokyo. Yeah. And that's tragic because Hong Kong was a wonderful city. Yeah. Wonderful city. Yeah, I was recently so, invited there and I chose not to go. Um, yeah. not, a not a terrible thing. I mean, I know I couldn't go there anymore. And, you know, we're not saying things that are specifically... We, we are listing out facts and conditions that they've done, they've imposed, right? So is that anti-government? We're listing, we're, we're talking and considering all this because investors and fiduciaries and corporate managers need to know what they're, what they're facing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a point here, for example, have, have corporations that are like a Ford or a Mercedes or a Nike, have they been able to get their profit profits out of China, we doubt it. Then you don't hear about it, but no, it's a closed capital account, which means that the foreign direct investment data is not foreign direct investment. It's probably a majority of that is actually retained earnings by the foreign companies that they can't get out of China. Oh, see, I was going to ask, that's what I wanted to, um, so I wanted to go back to like, you gave the anecdote about the person who invested in the pre-IPO, had to wait a year, went to sell, couldn't get it. So it's going to ask like, if you extrapolate that out even further, if that's, you extrapolate that out, maybe it's a bigger trend. What does that mean for corporations that have earnings over there? Exactly. Exactly. Those earnings are, we, we sense, and I've, I've had a few discussions with people uh, in the know, we sense a lot of those earnings, if not all of them are retained earnings that are kept in China, and the Chinese data services use those figures for foreign direct investment, which means that a large amount of foreign, which has collapsed recently, by the way, but historically, a large portion of that foreign direct investment were actually just retained earnings of foreign companies. Isn't that interesting? You know, people say you can't trust Chinese data. No, you can't. Um, so that's just another example of you not being able to trust it. Now we're saying things that, you know, uh, a lot of investors don't want to hear because they're, they're quite happy to follow the, the current conventional wisdom. The trouble is, this is all coming. This will all impact their investable regions where they can put money. And if you are a fiduciary of any sort, are you going to put money into a place that you do not know whether you can get your money out upon liquid, liquidating investments? You don't know. Um, what was the company that... Oh, here's another big... Here's a big piece of news. Cargill have just sold their Chinese exposure, meat processing and one other area. Cargill is a very politically astute company. They don't mind what, what they do, where they do it, typically. It's rather like Glencore in the, the metals and mining industry. They'll go to the front line. They know what they're doing, very politically aware. They've just sold their Chinese company. The agriculture exactly. company. Yeah. yeah. Cargill. Oh, Car oh, sorry, Cargill. Yeah, Cargill. Yeah. What does that tell you? Now, somebody said, well, it's not making enough money. How do you not make enough money in China when they're food they are short of food? 
twenty percent. What is it? Twenty percent of the world's population, ten percent of the world's arable land. Why would you? No, this is this is they're getting out because of politics, but they won't say it. Interesting. Yeah. And um, by the way, they have to get their money out still. Hmm. Yes, they could do the sale. But they've got to get that money out. Now, sometimes that money can be extracted because the buyer's got large foreign account balances. Well, Nick, while I have you for just a few more moments, I, I want to bring up um, a piece that you and Harold co-authored, I think it was earlier this year, about China uh, being the next Japan. Um, would love for you to kind of frame up the thesis there, and then we can delve into you know some of the more the, some of the implications, okay. maybe from a macro perspective. Well, if if we're looking just at economics and take away everything we've just discussed, but all being very relevant. Um, our sense is that, you know, she is an expert in in the uh, the uh, on the subject of the end of the Soviet Union. That's what he and a lot of his, you know, a lot of the CCP spent much time studying. We actually think they should have probably been studying the lost why Japan entered the lost decades, the bubble. Think about the bubble in the bubble in Japan was primarily a real estate bubble. Well, China had just gone through the biggest real estate bubble in history that just went Poof. Now, what, does, what implication does that have on China's economy? Everybody says, well, you know, the minute they reopen, we're going to get revenge buying and spending by the consumer. No, you're not. <laughs> it's just a simple behavioral economics, you know, as espoused by Kahneman or, or Tana. Revenge spending by the Chinese consumer. Okay, they've just gone through year, three years of COVID. There's no health service, no national health service. There's no unemployment benefit service. So there's no social we welfare in that respect. Com this is what you get with a communist state as opposed to a socialist state. Th those consumers that can afford to go out and spend, their biggest asset was their real estate which just took a massive hit between 40 and 60% in certain cases. Certain cases wiped out completely. So you are then relying on your domestic consumer to pull you out of the funk, but they spent three years with potentially some of them no revenue. And if they're a middle-class consumer, forget the high end, high end's always got them. Middle-class consumer, They've just had their biggest, most biggest part asset in their portfolio, their their house. The value has just been killed. Okay, then these people are not going to spend. And the the problem is when she, I think it was last oh, October or November, and was reiterated in January. There was a, an article in Kyush, which is the Communist Party's magazine of record. Okay. And she's, she, this was something we cottoned onto and I could fixated on. In the old days, prior to that, this, this article from she, exports were number one, followed by infrastructure, followed by consumer in terms of priorities for the, the running the economy. She came out in this, this QC article and said, domestic consumer and domestic infrastructure spend are our number one priorities, and thus relegated exports to number three. Nobody caught on to that. So export dependency was relegated. But the point is they were putting such emphasis on the domestic consumer. Well, it doesn't add up. You know, as far as I know, one on one still equals two, but in this case, it didn't, right? It, it wouldn't add up. They've just taken a massive hit uh, to their portfolio value. They've just had three years of crazy lockdowns, um, and if you look at the, it, this is why we have, have had a disappointment with Chinese economic performance. It was all bulled up by Western analysts at the banks, by the Chinese. Big boost, big boom when we get out. Where has it been? It hasn't. It's just not been there. It's been a complete and utter disappointment. And it looks like it's going to continue because they're not going to hit you with, uh, a big chunk of stimulus. So our view is you combine you combine a weakening economy that when you think about it, if you've lost 
40 to 60 percent of value on your biggest asset, you are going to be pretty frugal going forward for 10, 20 years, right? You're going to rebuild your, your, your personal value sheet. So if you look at that, then you look at the geopolitics of the decoupling that China are imposing and the decoupling the developed markets are imposing. That's a negative on the export side. You look at the population, it's just tipped over. So their demographics are bad, like the Chinese were. And we, we sense that Chinese growth is going to just really disappoint and be very low for at least the next 10 years. At least, by the way, that's an emphasis, at least the next 10 years. And that follows, you know, why would China avoid a middle, middle income trap? There's also the other thing about China is they've got massive debt issues. The local governments are bust, some of them. So that's got to be resolved. Um, so the point is, China will disappoint. It's, it's going to have a lost decade, at least a decade, um, which is quite similar to Japan. Now, it's also hard for these countries to avoid a middle income trap. Uh, South Korea went through it, Taiwan went through it, the Asian Tigers all went through a middle, middle, middle income trap. So our, our view is that China, the other thing that's a problem, by the way, for the Chinese economy is the centralization of control. The fact that she is a wizard of Oz right at the top of the, the chain, and he decides on everything. And for him, from his perspective, as I mentioned earlier, Political ideology trumps economic pragmatism. You know, people say, well, the people won't put up with it if the unemployment rate is going up. The, the, why is there the social credit system? Why can they watch everything you do through technology? They can watch everything. It's all a matter of control. So if she is consistent and, and political ideology trumps economic pragmatism, and he's the man with the hand on all the levers. And despite their desire for foreign involvement in the economy, they make it harder and harder. Then where does the Chinese uh, economy go? It doesn't, it stagnates. You can see that, you can see that in their orders, you can see that in the fact that it's now distinctly disinflationary, which will come through to the rest of the world at some point. Um, but their economy is disappointed and it will continue to disappoint because you know, if there's a rely less reliance on exports, which there clearly will be, um, and more reliance on domestic consumption, this common prosperity, as it were, the consumer will disappoint in China. They will absolutely disappoint. You have to move income flow from the state-owned enterprises this is a, a Michael Pettis comment, and he's absolutely right. From the state-owned enterprises who benefit from everything to the consumer, the, the labor force, and that's when the consumer may get a bit better. But I don't see that helping that much either. Because, of, you know, those that can spend money, middle income, middle class, have, are carrying this huge hit to their balance sheet. One sign, one clear sign that, it's not going to work in terms of increased spending. Is you know people say, well, you know, China Lunar New Year, they'll all be traveling. They all tra traveled internally. They didn't travel like they used to internationally. That's a start. Um, now that you've seen luxury goods equity prices, LVMH, and so on and so forth, start to come down that they were all leveraged to China. Um, so I think one thing, one area I think the Chinese will do well in is EV cars, because they're producing them and they're priced cheaply, whereas the European automakers, for example, the Mercedes and Audi, et cetera, are making EV cars that are good, but very expensive, right? So people don't want to spend all that money in, in harder times. So that's something that, we should take a note of. Yeah. So there, there, there's that thesis, and and you know we re it's publicly available on the on the web 
you can find that particular article. And then a symposium of agreements or critiques on the magazine, the International Economy magazine. Right. I'll make sure I link uh, it in the show notes too. But um, okay. Nick, I have to say, I have enjoyed having you on, listening to you. I took a ton of notes. I learned a lot from you. And I just want to say thank you so much for your time and would love Pleasure. to get you back on in the future. But I want to give you another minute or two to let know, let folks know where they can maybe follow you on social media, read your work. I know you have institutional and retail um, offerings. If you just want to take a moment to share some. That's very kind, Julia. Um, yes, both Harold and I are on Twitter although Harold is a bit more active than me, um, because just out of habit. Um, my, my handle is at N, N. Glinsman or NH Glinsman. Harold is at Howl's Rethink. That's his handle. Uh, so you can, I'm just checking what my handle is, because I don't know it. At N. Glinsman. Um, we also have, as a, we talked top before we came online, um, we have a Shopify store, um, and that's we launched that because we were being asked by a lot of people that wouldn't be appropriate for our inst institutional product in terms of pricing. Uh, you know, that's price for big institutions. How can we see what you're thinking? And we have a daily macro newsletter that's called Ahead of the Herd, where you see. Uh, a rundown of what's happened each day and overnight with some analysis as to what that means, the implications thereof. And then there's a couple of articles where you see uh, the thoughts of Harold and, and myself on big thematics, which is what, what we focus on. Uh, and we've made that available in, in a Shopify store, um, Mount, Glen Glins Mount Glen Glinsman Partners. I believe it is, or it's Malmgren Institute. Um, and, you know, at the moment, because we've just launched a store, we, we're giving um, a 50% discount on the daily newsletter. And it, <laughs> it's walking out the door. We're, we're rather surprised and humbled, actually. Um, and it, it's available there. Yeah. Any credit card, you, easy. I, I've been surprised at how how easy the process is in Shopify. So thank you for that. Much appreciated. Anytime. Nick Glensman, co-founder of Malmgren Glensman Partners. So great to have you on the show. Looking forward to having you pleasure. back on in the future. Thanks again, Nick. My pleasure, Julia. Looking forward to it too.